Hey. All right, we're going to get started now. All right, so start, as you mean to continue, start with an apology. I'm coming down with a bit of a head cold at the moment, so I'll do my best to struggle on through this and make something that, come up with something that makes sense at the end of it. All right, but stay, I'll, I'll stay behind here so we can keep a nice separation, yeah? Okay, so today, um, first of all, Kurt Stanway's lecture on Wednesday. Everybody enjoy that? Yeah, yeah. It's really, it's a really, really innovative and exciting new project, and Kurt's a really engaging and passionate speaker, so I was delighted he was able to, to come and do that for us. Today, we're going to talk, we're going to shift scales a little bit. We're moving in from talking about landscape patterns across the entire world to patterns at a more ecologically relevant level. So at the, in the, the opening lectures, they sort of said, okay, well, what is ecology? And ecology is the study of the interactions between organisms and their environments. And up to now, we've been talking a lot about how broad scale patterns and trends influence these environments and what brings about the, the, the actual type of environments we see in specific areas that brings about the actual types of species we see in specific areas. But today I want to talk a bit more localized and we're talk, going to talk specifically about habitats. And this is the, the, the physical structure, the physical environment which supports species interactions. We can imagine this in terms of marine food web with all sorts of marine species interacting, a terrestrial or forest food web or a freshwater aquatic food web. And all of these are ecological communities, distinct ecological communities made up of species interacting, species interacting species. But the type of species that we see in an area and which species are doing particularly well, which species are doing particularly poorly, is constantly in flux, it's constantly changing. And it's regulated by, at least in part, the environment that they exist within. You can sort of take this lake, sort of aquatic environment here, we've got different invertebrates, fishes, benthic production, pelagic production. If we were to go through a period of drought, and the water level was to drop. The habitat, the amount of space available to some of these aquatic invertebrates or fishes would become smaller. Those populations would start to, would start to contract. After a couple of years, we move back into a wet cycle again, get more water into the system, there's more space, there's more room for those populations to start to expand again. And that's characteristic of what we see whenever we look at an ecological community. Whenever we look at the numbers of species we see in an area or how a food web is structured, we term this as ecosystem structure or ecosystem function. Ecosystem structure is really what type of species are there. Ecosystem function is how does the food web work? How many trophic levels are there? What type of energy is fueling it? And as you go through time, that will constantly vary not naturally. And as ecologists, one of the, the tasks that we have is to understand when we, when we study a system, are we seeing natural variability or are we seeing something else? Are we seeing something that's not natural that's impacting this environment or how this impact, or how, or what's happening in this environment that's reflect some unnatural impact or a disturbance? And what we're particularly interested in is a disturbance, something that pushes the ecosystem out of its natural variability. And the system will, over time, will return and will respond. But we could turn up at a system, go to a, go to a river, sample the invertebrates. As we mentioned previously, this is sort of a classic way of interpreting the, the ecosystem health of a river is to look at the invertebrate community. 
based on what we see, if we go to an area and see that it's constantly made up of a, a moderately diverse community, we could say, yes, well, we've studied this system for three or four years. This seems to be what it is. But if there's already been an impact on this system, what we're, what we're seeing doesn't necessarily reflect the optimal situation for that, for that ecosystem. So it's important that as, as ecologists, we understand what's driving these disturbances and the context in which the, trend, the, the trends that we see exist. And to do this, we need to understand the landscape and the traits of the landscape. These are characteristic traits of landscapes which will influence ecosystem structure and function within a region, within any type of habitat. And to do this, we need to, there's a whole field of ecology termed landscape ecology. And this, we're going to touch on this today and sort of some of the, the, the main take-home traits of this field. What we're particularly interested in is the variation within a habitat. The variation that we see within a habitat will determine the type of um, population, the type of species it can support. A more variable habitat can, can, can support a larger diversity of species. We're really talking about broader spatial scales. We're not going to talk on a, I have a, I, a, character, a personal trait that I use words that are interchangeably that shouldn't be used interchangeably. So quite often today, I'm going to say habitat when I mean to say landscape. Habitat is, is more restricted again. Habitat is where this particular type of invertebrate likes to live. It's a landscape is what's happening in, this whole, in the whole lake. We're talking about landscape. We're going to talk about these broad ecological processes. And we'll touch, we'll touch directly on the roles that humans have in this, but also a lot of the, the impacts that we're going to see or the effects that we're going to see are secondary impacts of human activity. The first thing we need to think about when we talk about landscapes is how do they come about? What gives rise to landscape and what causes variation within landscape? What can cause landscapes to exist and what can cause them to change? And these call, fall into a whole suite of different abiotic, physical or natural processes. Also, biotic processes where organisms can, can change a habitat or can change a landscape, see, I did it already, or specifically human activities. When we think of abiotic effects or abiotic characteristics, we can think of these as large, impactful environmental activities, things like, such as a forest fire or a large flood or a windstorm that comes through here that can change what was a forested environment with a forest canopy which would support a, that, that type of ecological community to an area of downed trees, a lot more decomposers, a different type of ecological community. Extreme examples such as um, extreme heat or extreme cold. We talked a bit in previous lectures about species succession and recolonization of new land following um, volcanic activity. Again, this is that's a very extreme example, but it's an example of how an abiotic or an environmental process can change the environment. Similarly, biotic processes can change the environment directly by the activity of one type of species on the environment. Classic, some classic examples, sort of from white-tailed deer populations in the, the south in, in the U.S., where they can come in and regulate forest growth. They get large population size. They feed an awful lot. 
and they feed on understory plant plant layers, and they will destroy they will destroy habitat, they will restrict plant growth. You can sort of see classic examples from exclusion experiments, where people will put up a fenced area, restrict deers or other grazers from from entering that area, and see a remarkably different habitat, a remarkably different characteristics of the landscape that will support something on that side of the fence will support a very different ecological community than something on that side of the fence, solely driven by biotic effects. In the African plains and the savanna, similar large, large herbivores, large grazers have similar have the same effect. And herds of elephants will move through, feed a lot, but also physically manipulate the environment by, by felling trees and move, moving the landscape. We see closer to home in, in Canada, there's a whole suite of similar traits. Beavers, for example, for example here, of um, creating a small, a small dam but can create much, much larger dams. This is from uh, Wood Buffalo National Park. And that beaver dam there is estimated at the moment at 850 meters in length and increasing. And that creates a host of different environments, a host of carryover effects. It's changing a lowland or a terrestrial environment into a wetland. It's creating different nutrient dynamics. Once you've created this wet wetland, rivers which were moving right through are now stopped. We're getting increased sedimentation, increased nutrient buildup, changing the types of, of trees and the type of com structure, com community that we see in these areas. <laughs> Similarly, migrating birds ha can have a massive effect on, on the areas when they arrive. There's an increased population size of snow geese at the moment, which are in their annual migrations arrive on the, the west coast of Hudson Bay. And they forage, particularly in the summer, on various different routes and rhizomes in the, in the spring and later in the summer, will forage on, on, on emergent leaves, emergent vegetation. As these populations are increasing, their, their impact, the amount, of their, the amount they're foraging is increasing. And this is reducing the, the ability for the plants to, to hold the soil together. Because there's fewer plants or fewer smaller plants, leading to greater erosion, leading to different dynamics of colonizing plant species. And this kind of looks like an abstract art picture here in the middle here is a consequence of that. And what, what we're seeing here is different plant species which have recolonized this area, resulting in this, mo this different mosaic. And each of these zones support a different type of community, but the change overall in the landscape will also change the, the types of communities that that landscape can support. Finally, insect outbreaks. Next Wednesday, there's going to be another guest seminar by Emily Owens, who's working on the current outbreak of spruce budworm in New Quebec and New Brunswick. And this is directly linked to what, she, what she, her work is on. That as these insect population booms, they defoliate large parts of the forest. That can directly result in or can be targeted or have a greater impact excuse me, on the canopy layer. And as we saw in previous sections when we talked about light, if we lose the canopy layer, that will have a massive, lead to a massive change further down in the, at the forest floor. So but the presence of these, these insects is entire, can entirely shift and change the dynamics within, uh, within, within the forest. Human activities can wear an, another species. And we have a, an immense impact on, on the environment around us. 
typically, the, the well, it is whenever we look at the, the effects of of human disturbances on the on the planet, it's greater than any other species. We talked a bit about remember where what was it the last lecture on terrestrial environments when we discussed how agriculture in the in the, in the, in the Midwest, in the US, replicated the natural environments, where in the tall grass areas there were a lot of um, maize and intensive cereal crop agriculture, the shorter grass, a lot more pasture. By coming in and regulating and taking over this environment, we've dramatically, dramatically modified it, broken it up into different sections, restricted the opportunity for the, the native and resident plants and animals, introduced a whole host of new animals and plants, and added things like fertilizer. Do I have a question? Yeah, sure. Mm, so keystone species is, maybe I'll bring it in a, in a lecture now, or a subsequent lecture now. Um, keystone species is a very specific type of an organism. A keystone species is something which has a an impact on the community or on the environment, which is greater than, it's not in proportion to its its abundance. Yeah. Even just by their natural presence. These, a lot of this we're talking about, certainly something like a beaver certainly would be considered a keystone species, but spruce budworm, not so much because it's, it depends what your, what, you've, what your time frame is, but it's not something that's always there. It's not something that's always part of the environment. <laughs> by our intensive agriculture, by harvesting for, for timber, we're having a massive impact on the environment. And we're, one, one, one of the, the, the key characteristics of this is fragmentation, where we've taken a, call it a natural environment, broken it up into sections, and managed these sections independently. And our sections how we divide up land does not follow, or typically does not, or regularly does not follow on from the natural topography or the natural boundaries within the system. So by, by, by default, how we influence the environment will be different to what you would see in a, in a natural situation, in a natural environment. And there's a plethora of examples of this anywhere I could take I could, I could take an overview map of anywhere in the world look at it over the last 150 years and show you a plot similar to this but this is the one that's in the textbook so we'll use this and what we, what we're looking at here is a is heathland so think of almost like a, a marsh or a bog or a wet wetland in Poole in Dorset in the, the south of the United Kingdom south, southern England the green areas are the heath, the lighter green or greb, sort of like yellowish areas are, are not heath. We call them agricultural or, or urban land. And what you can see from, what's it, 17, yeah, 1760 through to over the over course of about 200 years, the one, the, the relative abundance of, of green space has decreased by what was it, 86, 85%. But it hasn't decreased uniformly. It hasn't decreased in there were six patches, and there are now six patches, but they're all that bit smaller. They've become far more fragmented. They've become a, a, mozo, a mosaic of much, much smaller patches. And this has a massive impact on, on the ecology. This is a direct change to at a, at a landscape level, how populations exist and how communities exist. And when we want to understand landscapes and understand how they, 
how they determine what types of populations and communities we see and how they influence populations and communities. We're looking at three specific traits. So this could be a zoom in on a little patch and pool or a little, a little subset of pool. And what we see is this sort of matrix of, call it habitat and not habitat. And the habitat is spread in patches, in these discrete little zones. Each patch at the edge has a boundary layer, so the boundary between habitat and not habitat. And in some instances, there are corridors between patches. There are laneways or gaps with it between direct subsections of, of habitat which species could move between, allowing them to get from one patch to, to another. These three aspects of a landscape all have different effects or impacts on the on the communities that they support. And probably for the for the guts of the remainder of this lecture, we're going to just talk, run, run through these and talk about these patches, boundary effects, boundary layers, and corridor effects in, in, in more detail. The distribution of, of patches, boundaries, and corridors will be different in different environments. So here we've got a, a regular, more regulated agricultural environment where we could see there's distinct patches of forests within a, a mosaic or within a framework of, 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 of agricultural land. This is a more cl or a classic example of a subarctic landscape where we've got a whole series of small ponds, small lakes interconnected by small streams sitting within a, a wetland or a terrestrial environment. All of these patches, or a patch here and a patch here, will have the same ecological effect. The traits that we're going to talk about about a patch will be the same for a lake as to, as to a forest, as for a forest. Or for a, a, a patch of wetland, or a patch of terrestrial land, or, or a field. But the actual patches differ depending on where we are. What we're, and specifically, what we're interested in. If, as an ecologist, you're studying this zone <clears throat> from the perspective of a fish, it's going to be, or if you are in this zone as a, as a fish, how you can move around this landscape and what this support this landscape gives you or what the the effect of this mosaic on your, your life history strategy is going to be very different than if you're a moose. So when we're studying these environments, we're always studying them from one perspective. The type of organism that's being studied defines how we interpret the patches, the boundaries, and the, the connections between them. And more specifically, the, the landscape when we, is characterized, the characteristics of the landscape are relative to the species or the system that we're interested in rather than a defined size. We could say that, oh, well, if we want to protect, or if we want to set up a, a protected area, what size does that protected area need to be? Well, that depends if you're setting up a protected area that's sufficient to protect shrews, hare, moose, fish. Depending on what the species, what species we're interested in, that determines how, the, how we view the landscape. And that determines how the landscape will influence that species. There are certain characteristics of 
of each of these that are that are, that are standardized. Larger habitats or larger patches will contain more individuals of any of a given species, so they contain a larger population size, and they'll also contain more species. So you'll have a larger community or a larger increased species richness. We can think of this either as a difference between a forest and a small patch. It's a pretty extreme example, but I'll give you that. But a small patch of forest versus a much larger area. Here we're going to have far more individuals in this larger area. We're going to ha also have far more, a, a greater diversity of species in this larger area. The same will follow through for, for a lake. A larger lake will have more species, great more or more and more individuals. When we define a, a marine protected area, the size of that marine protected area will determine the amount of species or the amount of individuals and the amount of species that we protect. Solely due to the amount of resources that it can produce and the amount of distinct niches that it can hold. Also, we see a direct correlation between, or with it really in animals, between body mass and the size of its home range. Larger animals need a, a larger home range. So say for, for a herbivore or a carnivore, typically, which of those two will need a larger home range? Anybody? Typically, so typically carnivores will require a much larger home range than a herbivore. They've got different physiologies, they've got different resource availability, they've got a different life, life history trait, that they will need to be able to forage over a larger area to obtain enough resources. So again, if we're thinking in terms of a our, our landscape and what type of species it supports. If we want to support or build a landscape that can support large carnivores, it needs to be a very different landscape than something that can solely support herbivores or even large herbivores. We have to match our view of the landscape to the species in question. Or the, or the situation or the system in question. And this is one of the reasons that when we assign or when we push to have areas designated as protected areas or conservation areas or national parks, we always try to get the largest area possible and not have it fragmented, not have it broken up. This is a map of Kurt maybe shows something like this on last week or on Wednesday of the, the, the boundary outline of Fundy National Park. We've got over two hundred and over two hundred kilometers, square kilometers of conserved area that's been conserved and preserved for over sixty years. And you can even just visually look at the, the difference in the landscape outside of that boundary. The inside of that boundary, still relatively lush, green New Brunswick, but it's a lot more fragmented. There's a lot more agri some agricultural sites. There's a lot more roadways and things like that that are dissecting and breaking up the breaking up the environment or breaking up the landscape. So the patches will determine the, the type of species that, it can, that can be supported in terms of their functional traits. The next piece I want to talk about are boundaries. So boundaries are the, the transition zone between, between habitat and, 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 and non-habitat. Let's jump back super quick here. Okay. 
So we've got, we've got our patch of habitat within the matrix, and what we're interested in is the actual boundary zone. These can be quite abrupt, or they can be quite diffuse. So if we think of a boundary, a direct boundary between a, a terrestrial and aquatic zone, a, a, a river and a lake, sorry, a, you know, a, a lake, lake and a field, it can be a, it's typically a very strict boundary. We've got one aquatic habitat, one terrestrial habitat. Similarly, in a, a managed agricultural area, we can have a very strict boundary between agricultural land and forested land. In a natural environment, that would typically be far more diffuse. We'd move from a inner forest slowly through through a boundary area. Is that a hand? No? Yeah. These are these boundaries are typically hotspots for diversity because they have characteristics of both types of environments. And they blend, you can get a blend of species from here, from environment one to into environment two. And these sort of diversity, diverse conditions support a variety, a variety of different types of niches which can in turn support a variety of different types of consumers. And what we, we term the, the edge effect is essentially this, this characteristic, this trait of increased functional and, and, and biological diversity associated with, with boundaries. And quite often, the greater the, the, the difference between, between the two types of habitats, the, the bigger that variant, the greater the edge effect, the greater the amount of species diversity that we can see within these two different habitats. There are some species that are specifically, specifically adapted to to feeding in this environment or to life in this environment. This is a bunting, an indigo bunting, and it nests solely on the edge of woodlands and feeds primarily on, in, the, on, in the field environment. So it's a, a, a boundary zone species. They, without this boundary, this, they don't have everything they need. They don't have access to, if it's just solely a purely a field environment, they've got all the food they need, but they don't have any nesting, any materials for building nests. They don't have any area to, to build nests to stay away from predators. They've got low reproductive success. If they're in a pure forested area, They've got lots of nesting materials. They've got areas that they can be away from predators, but they've got very little few food, so they don't have much, they have low reproductive success. So the boundary zone between these two is the best of both worlds. And it allows, this is, so this is one character, one example of why we can see higher diversity in this boundary zone. However, the, reserve, the opposite is also true. The, living on the edge of the edge effect can cause problems. Predators use the edges to travel, resulting in increasing predation around the edges. What's good for an indigo bunting is also good for, for a bobcat that likes to feed on indigo bunting. There's an abundance of food, there's habitat in which they can hide and ambush prey. As you move 
further away from, from, from the edge, predation rates decrease because you don't have that shift in, oops, sh shift in habitat types. <clears throat> So this is a plot, a figure taken from your book, predation on, on, on different bird species. Close to the forest edge or further, as you move further in, into the forest. And here we can see the frequency of nest predation decreases as you move further into the forest. So it's a trade-off. The further you go into the forest, the better it is for your ability to be, or your, you lower your risk of predation, but you're further away from food. So the edge effect, or these boundary zones, can be a, a good area to live in, but also have certain risk. And that, essentially what we're, what we're describing there is a niche. And these boundary zones represent a different niche, and they represent a niche which consumers have, have adapted to, which these bird species have adapted to, and also their predators. And if we move through a forest, we see changes in the makeup of the, of the community. Typically, so here we've got sort of to total species biomass, or to total species density. As we move from the, the edge of the forest further in towards the center of the forest. The main thing I want to draw your attention to is that the edge species rapidly decrease, deep forest species start to increase, other species have, have, have different traits. <clears throat> As we move, typically there's overall there is an edge effect. But it's driven primarily, or that even within that, there are characteristics of special edge species and overall and, and more general species. Okay, we're going to finish up talking about the, the last component. So the corridors. So we know there are patches. The trait, the characteristics of those patches will determine the types of species. At the boundaries of those patches is also a very, is a, 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 a unique ecosystem or is a, an area which can present an ecological opportunity for, for consumers. It presents a niche and it's associated. Once we have a niche, we'll have consumers or species that will fill that niche. It's a different type of habitat within the landscape. The last thing I want to talk about is the corridors. So these are the sort of connectivity channels between, in between different patches. And these are, in some instances, they can be naturally occurring. The majority of these, certainly from the environments that we discussed, are, are man-made. And they can be either patches of hedgerow, hedgerow left in between fields, or riparian zones, for example. So it's where we've got ag agriculture within, within a river basin. And there's either regulations which say you can't have, you can't, you can't grow crops, so you can't certainly you can't apply fertilizers close to the river edge because of eutrophication, things like that that we talked about previously or potentially within a floodplain, that it doesn't make sense to, to have agriculture this close to the river. So what we're seeing here is these corridors between patches, corridors of habitat or environment that exist between different patches. And these allow, they can allow species to migrate through them to get from one patch to another, or they can represent habitats in, the, in their own right. It facilitates either migration of, it, of populations that want to move from one area to another, potentially seasonally. It facilitates 
gene flow, gene exchange between or with across an area. If we take an image or take a, an idea of We've got three, three patches. Each of those patches supports a, a population. That population's growth or its um, its genetic diversity is depend is determined by the diversity of individuals within it, de dependent on gene exchange and gene transfer within that population. In each of these. If they're completely isolated, they're restricted. We've got three small populations that won't do very well. However, if there's some sort of corridor between these areas, it can allow some exchange of individuals, some movement of individuals from one area to another. Similarly, if there's an extreme disturbance in one of these habitats, if they're isolated, say there's a forest fire, comes through this one habitat here, all the individuals are wiped out. The population is now only at two thirds of its size. However, if there's a corridor, it can allow individuals to escape and recolonize different areas. So having corridors has, a, has an ecological benefit and also a, a genetic benefit. These corridors there have specific traits, similar to what we discussed when we talked about patterns and the size and structure of a patch is related to the type of species it can maintain. Similarly, the size and structure of a corridor will determine the type of species it, maintain, it can maintain. We can take the example of a riparian habitat along a riverbank. That's sufficient to sustain pop terrestrial populations of small rodents or shrews, or even things like otters, small mammals that primarily live in the river, but need some terrestrial environment as well. But it's not sufficient to maintain a larger terrestrial habitat, herbivores, such as moose or deer, or terrestrial carnivores. So it acts as, as a filter. By having this, once we have this, that will then restrict the ability of some species to, to maintain themselves within, within this environment. If we go back to my sort of little hypothetical plot. And so, let's say, well, We've got a two, two populations here. If you are a, a shrew, it's easy for you to move along that corridor. But if you're a, a bigger organism, such as a, a moose, that or a, a large carnivore that requires a lot of resources, that corridor isn't sufficiently large to sustain you or a population of you as you move from one, pot, one, one patch to another. Similarly, they can, so corridor can offer a conduit for predators to move through. You're at increased risk of predation as you move through the corridor. There are also pathways for, for disease or for invasive species to move through. This is examples of um, Asian carp, the big head carp, or silver carp, things like that, that are currently of serious invasive species working their way up through the Mississippi and the Missouri, and just about to get into the Great Lakes. They're, they grow to, to very large sizes, 
and in incredible densities and restrict resources from a whole plethora, a whole host of native species. And they're using these corridors, naturally existing corridors, to colonize continental US. Corridors themselves can also provide a habitat, particularly for, for smaller organisms. Well, with this example of a riparian habitat, is more than sufficient to sustain invertebrates or small mammals. Hedgerows, particularly in Europe, where it's sort of a characteristic of our, of our agricultural system, have our host to um, a unique assemblages of small mammals, of birds, of, of plants. And at the moment, there's pushes towards sort of green, green urban environments, increasing the, the presence of either uh, of, of ecological corridors, so they're integrating that into our city, city planning. The last thing I want to mention is a slight tangent, but it does fit in, is roadways. And roadways are possibly the, the single, well, they are amongst the, the greatest, the most severe impacts that people have on an environment. Immediately, once there's a roadway into it in an area, it's fragmented. There are so, there's some boundary to some organisms, to some species moving, moving between these, between the habitat. It's, it's broken down what was one environment, straight away is two much smaller environments. They're associated with a lot of rat animal fatalities and through, through roadkill. And we're starting to try and address this through diff different approaches to try and either build what are called biodiversity bridges or underpasses to allow, to restrict the, the effect or restrict the, the degree to which roadways fragment landscapes. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that for today. Have a nice weekend and we'll pick it up on Monday. Cool. Sure. Um, so just, I just wanted to get the idea of the landscapes